my son, who will be discussing the experience of uh, sensory architecture. Uh, thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate you turning up. I know you've got lots of work on. Two weeks, big hand in, Augustus is telling me, so appreciate it. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about sensory architecture. I'm going to, if I can work this thing, I'm going to explain what I mean about sensory architecture, because I think everyone will have a view on it. And then I'm going to show you some examples of our work, which I think can do relate to what sensory architecture is. So this, this was the image for the um, poster. Does anyone know um, Santiago Ramon de Cajal? He's, he's widely considered the like, grandfather of neuroscience. 1899, he was um, producing drawings of, like, this is of a nervous system. Um, di dissecting and drawing things that he saw um, and started off as an artist and got heavily involved in the birth of modern neuroscience. That's me. <laughs> um, I've put that up there to remind me to tell you that um, luckily or unluckily for you, I've just come back from Mexico for three weeks. Um, where I was really l quite lucky to be involved in a conference um, where 30 architects and 30 neuroscientists and cognitive scientists were invited for workshops and lectures uh, in Mexico. This is me wearing um, the right colour T-shirt for a Barragan building tour. Um, so I'm, I'm not pretending I'm an expert on neuroscience or what's going on in that field, far from it. I've just, to be honest, been introduced to it. But from what, from what I've read and from what I've learned so far, I think it's super important in the future, coming decades for architects to learn from what's going on in brain technology, how we understand how the brain works, because ultimately you'll be designing spaces one day for people with brains. And um, if, you can, if you know how to design for them, all the better. <coughs> so this is obviously a human brain. Lots of different parts of the brain are control lots of different senses and different areas and memory and balance and but essentially, our brains are <clears throat> they're full of 60 billion neurons, which are tiny little electrically charged um, bases of matter. And they, our senses are the, a detection of electrical signals. So we sense something, we see it through our optical nerve or through our nose, or we touch something. An electrical signal happens in our brain, and it can connect to another neuron, and it can create different sensations or reactions or bodily movements and our brain passes that on. Now, when we talk about sensory architecture, the first thing I get asked is, okay, so you're talking about the five senses, which, yeah, we are. I, I refer to these paintings a lot on projects with clients because they depict, it's a, it's a Renaissance collaboration between two artists, um, and they painted the five senses. So obviously, so I've put, I've put seeing first because I, I've put it in the hierarchy. I think our culture is currently, uh, gives meaning, more meaning to us. I think, I think in our culture, seeing is looking at things and images, post-internet age, is pretty much what our culture is about. Um, and you can see things in the distance, you can see things close to you, you see shadow, you can see light, colour. And there's touching, obviously. You can touch a metal handrail, or you can touch a timber handrail. Both going to feel very different in your hand, aren't they? Depending on what part of the world you're in, as well. 
You know, if it's a cold winter's morning, walking up a public stair with a metal handrail, it's not going to feel comfortable. <clears throat> Tasting. We all like to taste. We all eat food, hopefully. Um, smelling. Okay, there's good smells, there's bad smells. But it's not, not, in terms of architecture, I would say seeing and touching are always at the forefront. Oh, how does that feel? Oh, that's nice. I like that. I like that wall. Or, but tasting architecture would be strange. Smelling architecture? Could do. Different spaces smell different, depending on the materials in them. And obviously hearing. <clears throat> we can, yeah, you can hear. Buildings actually make sounds, don't they? They reverberate. My voice is, you're, you're hearing my voice through a direct way, but you're also hearing it three, four, five, multiple times because it's been reflected off certain wall finishes as well. Um, so basically, we are, we are um, a human in a body with a, lots of electrical signals happening in our brain telling us to do things or not do things. And we're continually affected by our built environment or, our, or the natural environment. So everything around us is continually changing our brain. Everything, literally everything that we do, where we spend time, what, what things we do. It's, um, and we're, we're also, uh, our brain is also affected by our memories. So not just what's happening right now, but what, what's happened in the past in our life. There's a small part of your brain called the hippocampus like about there. And Latin for hippocampus is uh, seahorse, so it looks like a little seahorse. That's basically where the main memory is stored in our, in our brains. And when you're in a space, you're, you're experiencing the space for your senses, but you're also recalling on memories to help you build a picture of what's going on. And all of these things you experience and sense in the world are obviously deeply affected by where you're from, how old you are, your attitude, everything, everything you do, your mental, physical health. I'll put that there, because the, the, some of these quotes are from lectures I have actually had in Mexico from, from neurologists, um, scientists. So this guy, Eduardo, he works at the Salk Institute in San Diego. So. I thought I'd remind us how beautiful Louis Kahn's building is. Do you guys know this building? Twice a year, you get this beautiful connection with nature. It's, this is called the River of Life, this central piece here. So, right, so we've established what sensory architecture is. We experience the world for our five senses. Yeah? Wrong. <laughs> So there are actually, if, if, you, if you read and research, there's actually, well, they don't know how many senses there are. Some people say 21, some people say 17, some say 36, and there's more coming because the, there's more research happening every week that goes by. So just, give, just to give you a bit of a breakdown, obviously vision, you can experience different lights and colours, and the spectrum that we see is red, green and blue. Hearing, okay, that's one sense. Smell, we have 2,000 receptors in our nose. Does that mean we just got one sense? Maybe, maybe not. Taste. There's no way sweet, sour, salt, sour, bitter, and umami taste the same. We all know that. There's five senses there, in my opinion. Touch can be gentle, light, can have pressure. We can sense a light pressure and we can sense the heavy pressure. We sense pain, mental, physical, visceral. We can, we've got balance, that's a sense, to make sure you're balanced, or imbalanced. We sense things outside our body, 
We sense things inside our body. We sense how our body is configured in a space. We, we sense hot and cold. We all, we've all been on a train and, and the, the acceleration's jolted us back. That's a sense. We're sensing something in the world. We've all been hungry and full. The last one. I put the last one down. That's not a technical one. That's just me thinking, I've got a Do you ever had a sense where someone's looking at you? Just look, and they, they look away. There's no reason why you look. It's just I think there's a human sense that someone's looking at you or something's happening behind your back. You can't hear it, but I think you can sense it's there. So when we're talking about sensory architecture, like, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't count these as important things that your client or the end user go through, I think you're missing a trick. Everyone know this building, obviously? Probably one of my top five, six I've ever been to. I've travelled a lot. I've been very lucky to travel, and it was right, right up there. Um, so your, my, when I was there, my experience was truly multisensory. I saw the light coming through the windows and the shadow, and the, and the sun was flickering, and the, and the movement was my eyes were looking at. I could have, I had awe in the sense of scale of the columns. I could hear voices close by, sounds far away, and the echoes. I was kind of using my eyes and trying to figure out how tall the columns were and imagine myself up there and how would that feel. So, like, haptically, I was in the space as well. It smelt different because it's beautiful stone and the echoes were different. And, you, you know, you, do, you don't experience buildings just through one or two senses. Yeah? You, you sense them multi-sensory and you're, you're, you're a body and a thinking, living thing with electrical signals experiencing the space. Now, <clears throat> that's quite simple neuroscience. But what, what they've also discovered in the, in the past few years is that you're not only viewing this cathedral in real time, you're also projecting all of the 1,024 cathedrals you've ever seen in your life back onto Gaudi. So what it's doing, and you're judging Gaudi versus all the other cathedrals you've ever experienced in real time, happening in like 0.1 seconds. And the brain is then judging these churches and cathedrals and, the, and it's either heightening or lessening your experience depending on how good the architecture is. So that's, that's what we mean by sensory architecture. And, and um, you can imagine des- being an architect designing for people humans in a space like that. They're just so changing and multifaceted and um, everyone's different, obviously, because everyone's had a different life and a different past. So it's pretty much an impossible job, to be honest. To, to, to <laughs> but you, you can do things like this, which just let people have their own view. This is one of my f- favourite restaurants, the River Cafe, Hammersmith. Um, and, you know, in nice restaurants, you experience the food, obviously, but it's the atmosphere. Um, three Michelin star chefs, oh, I forget his name, the guy that taught Gordon Ramsay. Anyway, he, um, he famously said that at the, um, the atmosphere and the restaurant's the most important thing, and then the service and the people, and then the food. And I agree with that. But imagine you're sat here, so everything's perfect. Look at the sun, amazing. The pasta comes out freshly made, amazing, so good. The wine. But then imagine you're here and then a, a sewer's broken on the road next door. And the smell is really bad. Really, really bad. That is not gonna stick, that is not gonna feel like a good meal. Even though the food's amazing, the atmosphere's there. One thing's gone and out, the smell pff, ruins the meal. That's all you'll think about. So we really experience the world in the totality of, totality of all our senses. One thing's off, especially a bad thing like that, then it's, it's ruined. So 
So body conscious design is a, is, a, is a communication between ourselves and the environments and our bodies and our senses and our memories. And we're just this plastic, plastic in terms of not a material, but plastic in a moving, breathing, thinking thing that's changing the whole time. And I'm, con I'm constantly right now reviewing how this lo old library space is in part compared to past ones. That's just who we are, especially architects. So as architects, when we talk about sensory architecture, we're, we're all, almost designing boundaries of experience for people to, ex to um, experience in the space. And obviously, boundaries change. And our senses are completely pliable and can be educated, like I just said. So what you feel, think, sense today will be completely different to tomorrow, even in the same space. Like the chef, Action Bronson, you know, he's cooked so many pizzas, he seasons them, he cooks them every day, and you've got the crust perfect just in the, in the grill, just the right time, and, he, and he's learning how to cook better pizza the whole time, he's getting better than me, because I don't do that regularly. And the ballet dancer, famously, Nietzsche said, has, has the music in her toes. She's, the, the, she's experiencing music through her feet. Capaldi, the guitar, you know, a, the guitar, a guitar is an, arch, is an architectural room. It's a timber box with a hole in, and strings, you play the strings and the sound reverberates through the, the architectural box and out. And the more he plays, the better he'll be. So we, we, we talk a lot about verbs and nouns in our practice, particularly with clients who um, you know, want to learn more about how they want to live. Um, the difference between a verb and a noun, obviously, is, is, is a, a noun is a description of something, and a verb is an ongoing, dynamic human movement through a space. You know, eating and communing and I put this in here, everyone I hope knows this building. Um, maybe top five, maybe top ten, actually. Um, but the weight, you can just see on that door the weight. You know where your hand goes, you know the shoulder movement you need to make. And then behind it is that. And it's, that is not just opening a door, that is a complete and utter dynamic experience of moving through a space. Small door big space afterwards, famously architects use that trick a lot. <clears throat> I've just got some images here I've just picked today. Right, how, how do you feel in this space? Right, this, is a, this is a New York warehouse loft. Do you feel cosy, warm, happy, sad? How different would you feel in this space? Do you know this building? Casa Galadi by Luis Barragan, one of his last ever built houses. I was lucky enough to meet his, um, the owner and had a walk around. This is the swimming pool. How do you feel swimming in that space? That is amazing. How do you feel in this space? You feel very different to there as you feel here, right? So different. How do you feel in this space? Everyone know this building? One or two nods. How do you feel in this space? Very different, right? Do you feel different to here than you do to here, right? Very different. Like a different person. How do you feel here? This is the entrance to the CIA building in New York. You're going to feel proud, aren't you? You're going to feel like proud that you're working for the CIA. The materials talk to you to try and make you feel proud as you enter the building. How do you feel in this space? Do we know this one? There's a lot of Louis Balagan, obviously. 
but I must say, having seen him in the flesh, he's, for me, he's gone to number one, straight to number one. He's a complete master. How do you feel in this space? No offence, I'd quite like to be there right now. Amazing, look at that bar. Volcanic rock bathing. That's the space. Your body, your thoughts, everything's going to feel very different. How do you feel this space? This is a space. Mental space. If I look at Roscoe's enough, some, sometimes if I've had a bad day or even a good day, I, um, I just try and um, go to the Roscoe room in Tate Modern. Just sit, chill out. Um, you're just completely transported to another space with this guy. <coughs> so architects make the stage for life to happen, designed to make you and the planet feel good. Well, that's what we should do, right? If we're good at our, if, if we've been taught correctly <laughs> in university, in life, if we've had good experiences, good intentions. This is, this is something we, we've got on our website. So architecture has the power to shape experience. Sensory architecture speaks to the human in all of us. <coughs> so that's what we mean about sensory architecture, you know. It's the whole thing. When we, when we work with clients, we are completely immersed in understanding their life and what they want, how they want to live their life, more importantly because they've come to us with a problem and it needs solving. It might be a house, it might be installation. Because, you know, science, the science is there in, in, in neurology and all the tools, all the information, all the papers, the books are there to, for architects to equip themselves with this knowledge, which is out there and we're currently not doing. So I'm just going to show you a couple of projects. I'm going to finish with a couple of projects and we can do talk, uh, questions. So this is um, Untitled House. This is a project we built um, about three years ago, four years ago. Um, the client, she used like VP Creative for a very famous global fashion brand. And she came to us because she liked some of our work. And we just sat, met, talked a lot, had some dinner, coffee, spent some time. And she was talking, she's, um, she grew up in Southeast Asia. And she talked a lot about the feeling of the rainstorm approaching when she was in Southeast Asia and the smell and the scent of the rain and how her mum always used to have like the door open and the monsoon, the rains would come, but they'd be inside, protected. So I was like, why don't we do that? London rains. <laughs> so we did. So we designed an extension specifically for her to experience rain and have a memory of her childhood while she's, while she's in her house. So we created these extra long overhang angled eaves, which are about well, over half a metre. And we did centrally pivoting doors that clip into these uh, ash columns. This is the kitchen. <coughs> so the other thing she asked us to do was her boyfriend's a very good cook so and she likes taking baths that's her thing so she was like can we have a space where like my boyfriend's cooking and i'm in the bath and we can just have a chat <laughs> and i was like well you don't want a bath in the kitchen well i've never seen it i don't recommend it um, but what we could do is we could, create a, we could create a void in between those two spaces and then have it open and closable and for privacy if you want to. So this, this is what happened. So this is downstairs in the kitchen and you can see the void up there which goes up to the bathroom, which is here. <coughs> and you can see the void on your left. And then above the void we had a roof light. And they, still, they like pass stuff up and down to each other there. And it's, <laughs> it's very unusual, but it, for them, that's, that's, that answered the brief. And um, we talk about James Terrell a lot in our, our practice. And we've, uh, you know, he talks about light as a material and that you can feel it physically. That you, you can, you can feel light, right? Like, 
there's so, I've, there's so many places I go where I'm just so offended by the light and I just have to move table. Or even I don't go to those restaurants or places anymore. It's just, it's just, I don't feel comfortable there. Um, but mem, mem, this is another one that we discussed with us. So me, is memory a material? Can memory be a material? Yeah, so th th this is her, the bath. So the other brief was the bath because she, she's got a crazy, crazy job flying all around the world doing fashion shows and she just wants one room where she can just forget about everything, no windows, close off and just retreat to the like, ritual of bathing. So the <coughs> Porcelain Gallery. This is, a, this is a tile showroom we did for a company um, six years ago now, I think. And it was the last remaining backland plot in um, the Hatton Garden district in Farrington. Excuse me. And the brief, the brief from the client was, because as a tile showroom, your clients are architects. So the brief was... When the architects come to their showroom, they, they don't want them to keep their hands in their pockets. They want to be touching everything. So what we did was we employed um, a ceramicist in-house just for the project, who was a part one, and she, she was interested in ceramics. So she, we, she was making ceramics when we met her. So she did the experiments. And basically everything you touched from the front door buzzer to un underneath these drawers, like that, all the finger pulls, all the handrails, um, all of the door handles were all made by her um, in-house, out of clay, and they were glazed and fired by us. And that, even though it wasn't the client's product, was a story and a narrative that the architects loved, um, because, you know, porcelain and tiles and ceramics are made from clay, they're 98% clay, they go through um, a vitrification process, which is a, basically a ginormous oven and kiln. Um, and these handrails had the same process. Um, so we were communicating with the visitors of the space constantly about what they were touching. And that, just, that conversation just flowed and their, their turnover jumped up crazily after this project. Um, and the shipping containers that we used were actually their, their containers they, sh they used to ship their products around the world, um, well, mainly from Europe to here. So we, we up, upscaled four 10, foot, four 10 foot versions, and the red ones are all one space cut together, and then the, the yellow one on top was twisted so, so it could uh, face a tree in the distance. Yeah, so th these, these, were the, um, these were the experiments we did with the handrails and, and we eventually chose the one up on the top left actually, which is like a dolly mixture, really sort of like colourful and we, we did this with lots of experiments of how the handrail would, was really textured wherever your thumb was. So as you go up a hand, as you go up the stairs, your, your thumb's on the inside, so the texture is on the inside. And then as you got to the top of the landing, your hand does that, so the texture moved into the middle. So you're continually communicating the thumb of the visitor. And I just love this quote. We use it all the time. And it's, you know, the hands want to see, the eyes want to caress. So going back to the very beginning, we talked about the five senses. Um, because, yeah, your eyes can do more than see. They can caress, they can do other things. <coughs> Wine cellar project. So the brief here was, again, for a commercial client, but it was, can we create a wine cellar with an atmosphere in Putney, in London? So what we did was we, we used the colour, and they're, they're a kitchen supplier called Bultalp, German supplier. So their kitchens are the ones on the right. And so what we did was, to create the atmosphere, we tried to make everything matte, matte, matte black, super matte black. Um, so basically, the colour of the black absorbs all the wavelengths of light 
reflecting very minimal ones back at you. So, so as you walk down into the space, it started to get a bit gloomy and dark. And there's very, very few lighting. There's only, there's only lights hanging down in the middle of these cages and the light from this um, wine cellar here. And we wanted it to feel like a cave. Well, this quote sums up what we've been talking about, you know, sensory architecture. You are a uh, body among objects that sees and touches them. <clears throat> this is just a close-up of the, the different textures of black that we used. So the, down to the hob, the glass induction hob, to the, to the timber top, to the laminate, to the concrete walls, to the mild steel staircase, even the... Even the the handrail, the fruit bowl, we, we, everything. The light switches, we, we controlled everything in the whole space. Clay House. This is a project we did quite a while ago, but we've, and we've used a lot of this uh, product, clay, um, and it's an incredible material. Um, these clients, a Japanese couple, came to us, and one of them had really bad asthma. Um, so we just did, we did a lot of research at the time about how you purify air in a flat and like the, you have the humidifiers, but we came across this material which is 100% natural clay. So it's, instead of painting on the walls like, you know, cheap uh, paint with toxins in it, which they do have, um, the original Victorian walls and floors were designed to breathe through lime, lime and lath plaster. So we reinstated that and it's got a lot of beautiful depth to it. But what it does is, it's because it's clay, it's a plant-based material, it absorbs the carbon dioxide and helps purify the air in the space. So creating a more healthy, happy home. And this, this was the, bath, the bath on the top floor, which is a traditional Japanese hinoki bath. And we had, um, we had water, we had fire there as well. Overlooking the forest, amazing house that one. And Earth, Earth has been the most essential building material since the dawn of man, obviously. Um, there's, there's a big movement now going on, I'm sure you're aware about all this rammed Earth and lots of people are using it in floor finishes and orig original chalk and what you dig up in your foundations, you're using in your finishes in the walls. This is a residential project for a young family we did um, a while ago. And the family are Lebanese, actually, and they, they loved cooking. Um, so we, the, the client had lots of collections of brassware, so we, we used that colour as a theme throughout the whole house. And these kitchen panels, these are like liquid brass. It was sprayed. <coughs> So as you walk through the entire house, all the little details were brass. Taps, um, plinths, light switches, kitchens, light fittings, everything, um, even, even down to the furniture. This is a project we completed last year, um, <clears throat> which is an installation project in uh, Clerkenwell. It was only there for three, three months, but it's, we were approached by um, a company called Ketley Brick, and they, they are a really old, traditional British quarry factory business. They've been operating outside of Birmingham for over 200 years. Um, they supplied all the bricks to the Barbican. Every single brick you see um, in the Barbican was supplied by them, famously, lots of projects. Anyway, they've got, they've got these... Um, They've got these kilns where they fire, and where, where they're located up in the Midlands, there's the, the clay is called Etruvia Mar. It's a, it's a very dense, ready clay. Um, the geology changes. So when it's fired, um, depending on how much oxygen you, you put in the kiln, it either comes out as a blue tile or a red tile or two in between. So those are the four tiles that, or slips that we had to work with. <coughs> Um, and this is an image, this is a painting of one of those um, old quarries 
in 1800 by a local painter called Cotman. So we kind of were looking at this research in the geology and we thought, okay, what, what if our installation um, is like a cut through the earth, through these mile pits? And by using these four, these four Ketley bricks, we could create, we could create gradations of, of um, red to blue, different colours. You, and you can... So we, we, we actually built this with the contractors. Um, it was hard work. And there's a, I've got a couple of films because basically all of these um, slips are cemented in, but they're not grouted. Whereas these ones here on the floor, all of the floor were placed on the side and we didn't, we didn't grout them in at all. So when you walked over them, it was like ching, 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 and the whole showroom would make noise. People would even walk on it and go, oh, sorry, it's a mistake. And then they did a launch night, and it was all about sound, and, and I've got a couple of videos I was going to show you. And it turned into a dance floor. <laughs> There's another one as well, it all got feel. Yeah. So we're now, based off the back of that, we're now uh, Thank you. We're now working on another, I, can't, I wish I could show it to you, but we're only literally, I'm going to start working on it tomorrow or Saturday. Um, um, we're paired up with an Italian tile factory and we're going to create a sound installation of their products that for, for Clark and My Design Week um, coming up. Um, sorry, not Clark and My Design Week. It's going to launch in August this year where basically architects can come and play an, an, an installation of their products and create sounds. And then all those sounds are going to get recorded over the three months and then it's going to be put together by a music composer and a, and a band. And so, again, building on that sound installation idea. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Um, with the wine cellar, um, would something like that be able to be um, uh, replicated within like a, a commercial building with the same sort of feeling to it? <coughs> that is a commercial building. Oh, it is a commercial building. Yeah, that's, oh, that's okay. a real working commercial does building that, like, in does Putney. It still apply to the, does it still apply to like, the building regulations? Of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be able to yeah. show it to you. Yeah, of course. All, all of our projects comply with building regulations. Yeah, no, no, yeah so like for public to use it as well. Yeah, 100%. Okay. You'd go and see it if you want. It's, it's, it's on the Lower Richmond Road in Kitchen Architecture. It's in the basement. Funny you should say building regulations because there was one issue with this job, which I'll, I'll be very truthful with you. Because we wanted everything black, in a public building, obviously on staircases, you have to have um, a colour difference with visually impaired people. So the sign-off day came, building control, and he was like, you can't have that because... It's black, it's all black. They need to see a difference. So just buy these yellow strips and stick them on there. I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do it. So we had about a half hour conversation um, and then we came up with the idea of if we polished the edge, because it's mild steel that rusted, oxidised and rusted, and then we sealed it. So if we polished the edge, it, it was almost like, um, you know, like the, the legs of these chairs, chrome, super chrome. So the, the edge was like all sparkly. And then, and then he managed to pass that, which is quite an like bespoke idea, but he, he managed to pass it. Did you look up on spot? Sorry? Was it done on spot or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. As he, as, <laughs> as, 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 he, as he was there, yeah, yeah. And he signed it off, I took photos, sent it to him, and he agreed it, yeah. Any other questions? Hi. Yeah, one of my projects. One project on one of the sets that you've shown us so far, which one would you pick? If I had to pick a 
project on one of the senses? If you, if you had the choice to build a project centered around one of the senses... Ah, oh, good question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, so we, we've interestingly worked with um, a company where all the builders are deaf. The entire company is deaf. From the directors to the electricians, the plumbers, carpenters, everyone. They work in London. They're Lebanese and they're amazing people. And they, when they meet you, they, they've got a sign interpreter. Um, and then when you get to know them and how to lip read, and you learn a few words that they tell you, building site words, and then um, they FaceTime each other when they want to talk to each other and they sign each other. So I'm really, having had that experience with them, I'm really interested in the designing, we'll be designing for people with impaired hearing. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to look out for a project that would do that. And, use, and they, because I've got friends now and builders who have that knowledge. And, so, and also, the same, with vi um, the same with seeing and hearing. And like everyone's got different thresholds and different things. So there's deaf people, and then there's like partially hearing people, and there's you know, 10% and 90%. So they're all different grades. So I think that would be a really interesting project to work with them on. So, um, I think it's interesting that um, your answer to that question, I guess. In and ask the question itself, what, what projects you'd like to work on kind of, and what centres you'd like to kind of almost work with. When you're kind of, I guess, working on projects or, you know, when projects come to you, do you, is, is that, I guess, because you've got so much, such a palette to choose from in terms of centres, mm. to an extent you can almost understand which ingredients will work with which kind of client or which kind of context. Um, but how... How often do you feel a, a pushback for someone just kind of wanting to go, no, 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 just kind of wanting to almost dilute that and, and go for some, and either for kind of cost um, reasons or, because I guess, you know, everything that we looked at is you know, quite kind of bespoke and beautifully considered, um, but how often does that sometimes come out Um does happen, of course, because we live in the real world, you know, of especially these times, you know, crazy inflation, geopolitics, you know, people don't want to be spending, if they can spend £100,000 rather than 150, they they'll do that if they're more sensible, if they're protecting their children's inheritance, you know, completely understand. But, of course, we do some projects where they don't make the website great. <laughs> they still, we still have some of those projects. But I would say maybe 70% of our work is, is this kind of real push at work, maybe, maybe 80. Um, but, and yeah, and you get clients who come to you who are like, yeah, we love your work, let's go for it. And then when the crunch comes with the budgets, and it's, and they sort of drop away. But we obviously don't, we don't show those what that work because obviously we want to win more nice work like, what I do nicer work like this. So, um, but to go back to the census question as well. We've actually got a client at the moment, with like super, super severe ADHD and autism, and he's and he's, we're designing his flat at the moment um, based on geometric numbers because whenever he sees numbers and there's order and structure in numbers, if things add up, like the Chinese calendar or 24, 20, number 24, it's 24 hours in a day, there's 24 shelves there. He's like chilled, and he's like that. That's his. That's his sort of um, calmness in the world. That's like his meditation. He calls it his yoga. When numbers add up, if you, if you, if we, if I designed like an odd number for him, it'd be like meltdown, proper meltdown. So interesting working with him as well because you know it's very different. And people like you know, as we talked about earlier, everyone senses the world differently, and everyone's got a different sense of what. They um, think good architecture is so. That's where I also want to say, you know, I absolutely love all the stuff that you've shown and the way you've talked about stuff. Okay. It's just so inspiring. Oh, that's good to hear. Thanks. Um, and yeah, um, uh, I remember having the same kind of experience when I went to walk into um, Sagra La Familia as well. I think uh, the first time I think everything's the source. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just such a kind of, I think it's only 
time I've ever experienced that. Yeah. And I've had, I've known people who are friends I've talked to, and they have the same experience. Yeah. It's just what amazing power, the power of art, architecture. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, me too. But yeah, Bar Barragan, anyone who gets to go to Mexico, I'd highly recommend. He was, he is honestly a master of light. He's just like a, just, just walk around each corner, it's like a cubist painting. It's like, what? It's like another cubist painting. And it's actual real spaces. And uh, the, the, the reason I think he was really successful, he never built outside Mexico. And he was always super stubborn. Um, and he just understood the light. And all, the, all of his pinks and his purples, they're actually from the cherry blossoms in Guadalajara. You just see the petals all over the floor, so he just took those colours and used them against the blue sky. And yeah, I mean, just culturally as well, um, amazing. Hello. Um, just sort of like, on your personal opinion, would you prefer sort of the grandness of the senses, or would you say sort of like prefer the sort of subtlety in like when you're designing for senses? Good question. Depends on what sense, doesn't it? Like, like if I'm eating, like if, if you're designing a restaurant, let's say, um, you want to be complementing the food. You know, if it's, I don't know, Indian food or if it's like different cultural food, I think the restaurant will change depending on, the restaurant shouldn't look the same. It should, you know, be linked to the food. And, um, <coughs> I think subtlety, like, well, just I think I would leave my answer to that would be just leave the subtlety or the non-subtlety to the user and the client. You just give them opportunities and scale and materials to have good sensory experiences in space. You know, textures, light, shadow, small ceiling, tall ceiling. What's around that corner? Just give them a, a canvas to live their life in, I think I would just leave it to them. Um, I, was, I wanted to ask sort of, uh, when, I guess, in general, uh, when designing architecture, or in general, in design, a lot of it is mostly done in uh, sort of the visual form of just drawing, rendering, and creating models, and all that. And how do you um, maintain, sort of, or I guess, Back to that, to, to the senses, and sort of remember, like keep them at the core of your design, and or even think of them as you're designing. While the, as in, I guess the design process itself is so visual and so detached from these senses. Um, I guess how do you maintain that connection in, in during the design process? In the design process, <coughs> but yeah, just continue talking, talking to people about it. Like, how do you want to? How do you cook? Like, how do you want to cook? Like, where do you want the smells to go? Do you want to smell the food, or do you not want to smell the food being cooked? Like, do you want to hear the bath being run, or do you not want to hear the bath being run? Like, do you want to hear your husband getting up at six in the morning, or do you not want to hear him getting up at six in the morning? You know, those are those are fundamental questions that humans need to answer if they want a happy life, right? So everyone's different, um, but we ask those quite personal questions, specifically with house design. Because it's like, the house, <coughs> you know, your house is not just a home, is it? It's the center of your world. It's where you relax, feel safe, and that's, um, yeah, you've got, you've got to use every opportunity to sort of make them, make the, the house uh, the best it can be for the, for the end user, I think. How, how do you kind of communicate those kind of ideas? Or to our guests that, you know, it's easy to communicate, this is what it would look like. Yeah. We use a lot, well, so I sketch a lot with, like, coloured pencils. So those sort of sketches are the first things. And we use a lot of, like, precedents, really super selective on what images we choose to show them. It could, it could feel like this, or it could, it could have that scale, or it could... Um, and then, obviously, we, then we go into, like, physical models and... Um, computer modeling. But we also, we also do, 
like with the good clients, I'm getting good now, having been in practice for 12 years, I can spot good clients and bad ones quite quickly, so it's a skill. <laughs> so um, with the good ones, yeah, we, like we spend, we hang out. We, you know, we, we work with a coffee entrepreneur like Augustus and, you know, we met there, didn't we? And he's, um, when he said he wants to set up a new coffee brand called Lyft, we literally spent two days going around the best coffee shops in London. Um, this is good, this is shit, this is this, this is that, that's bad, it, this tastes bad and all this. So, and you just, yeah, you spend time with them. I think spending time with them and then also, sometimes I take them to like exhibitions or like the John So Museum to, to, to describe an idea or something, you know, so just hang out and spend a lot of time together. Sometimes they send me films, watch this film. I like that, that minute, that, that bit there, I like that space. So, yeah. Yes, huge. Yeah, it's trust. Massive trust. Clients put in architects, huge. Not only financially, but just like, can you make my life better, please? Is what they're saying. <laughs> so that's a good client. What's a bad client? Oh. And how do you avoid them? <laughs> um, I think I said this before, like, I think as you, as you, move into practice and you work and you get to hang out, work with people and different types of people, you can just get a sense of like, I think the skill of some architects should be almost a psychiatrist, almost like psychoanalyst. And you can tell if people are like, you know, hard to work with or not hard to work with. You can tell by their job, what they do, what car they drive. You can tell a lot about people, what they wear, I think so. All those things, I think um, you can spot a bad one, but I wouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> I've got bad clients as as we speak, but you you know you just sometimes they act. They're good at acting at the beginning, <laughs> but um, no, I mean, yeah, I don't think there's a set rule. It's sort of like your experience. What when practice began, yeah. where it is now? Yeah, that does change, obviously. <clears throat> because when you set up your own practice, like, you don't have any body of work to show them. You have like, mild enthusiasm, major enthusiasm, and just like, a willingness to please people. And then gradually, after a couple of years, three or four years, you've got like, one or two projects you're proud of, and then you put it on your website, and then people hopefully get it published. And then people see that, and then they come to you for that job. And then you just start attracting the right kind of people. So I'm a big believer in just, it's all about the work for me, because that work we've always found, if it goes out and gets published, or social media, it attracts new clients that like that kind of work. And then you're just on a never-ending run of attracting the good clients, basically. That's how it works. Thank you.